Okay, good morning and hello everyone and welcome to 30 Minutes of Wisdom. Whenever you're listening, whether it's morning, noon or night, I'm your host Robin Blank Muscari and we get together twice a month, the second and fourth Friday to share wisdom from great thought leaders to support you in your personal and professional development. And our guest today is just a gem, a gift, and many of you know her. There she is. Let me introduce you. Oh my God. <laughs> can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Oh, well, um, our guest today is um, a life transitions coach and grief specialist, best selling author, keynote speaker, media host of her own podcast, Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw. And for more than 25 years, she has dedicated herself to helping people navigate the stress of change. Is that um, important right now, you guys? And the challenge using mind-body techniques. Um, she has degrees in education, communication, a graduate in counseling credentials and grief and addictive disorders. Um, she's written a whole bunch of books. <laughs> Chakras, The Magnificent Seven, Grief, When Will This Pain Ever End? In her latest book, Saying the Right Thing When You Don't Know What to Say. But what I wanna say, is it is so wonderful to have you. We've been wanting to do this for so long. And for those of you that have been around Lifeway for a while, you know this magnificent being Paula Shaw. As she started a program that turned into Lifeway Connect, she and Jim Caldwell hosted, what was it called, Paula? Lifeway Now. Lifewave Now. She hosted a program called Lifewave Now and um, has been a gift to our entire Lifewave community. And she is a gift to all of us. And, you know, this morning we're going to talk about some things that are really timely about what's going on in the world and how we can navigate these times and stay, keep our vibration high, keep conscious, keep motivated, inspired. And so, welcome, Paula. Thank you so much, dear. It's so good to be here. I've been I, so looking forward to this, both I because I love you and I love what you're doing, but also because I think we, you're right, we do have some really important things to talk about today. Yes, we do. And um, just so everyone knows, uh, we typically do these for 30 minutes and then Paula's agreed to stay on a little bit after for Q&A and you can put your questions in the chat. And, um, you know, the world is going through things like we've never been through before and mm -hmm. we've all experienced so much change so much loss and so what could you start out and we're going to define grief and loss in just a minute but could you help you know people understand what what part does loss play in people's lives today with all that's going on in the world wow that's, that's, a, big that's one. a great question and a huge question I think, you know, there is nobody on the planet from the youngest child to the oldest person on the planet that has not experienced some kind of loss with what we've all gone through with this pandemic for the last year and a half now. And I think, you know, just imagine, think about the little ones. Suddenly they're seeing people with masks on their faces. They can't see the expression of the face the way they used to. Uh, school changed completely. So all our children from K through 12 through college are all experiencing something very, very different. Um, jobs were lost. Restaurants were closed. Our way of life. I mean, remember in the beginning, like, I don't know if you remember seeing Pavarotti walking through the streets of Rome on Easter Sunday. There were all these places, Paris, where the streets were just empty. And so life as we knew it, interacting with each other, um, was lost, was lost. And so for many people, the isolation was devastating. For many relationships, the constant togetherness became really problematic. So we had loss going on on so many levels, financial loss, health loss, death, you know, um, the loss of our freedoms. There were just so many places where we were dealing with loss. So I, I've done even a couple of podcasts that I, that I titled A World of Grievers, because when you experience loss, the normal natural response to that is grief. And we all experienced loss. 
So like it or not, here we were, all of us grievers. Oh my God. All of us grievers. And it's not something we've been trained to deal with. Mm -mm. And it's not been okay to deal with it. So before we get into how to deal with it, how about if you define loss and grief for everyone, because then we can take it the next step from there. Because like you said, we're all experiencing it in, in our own unique ways. And there's, it's, it, no one has been spared. From Absolutely. This That's so true. Yeah. So I think of loss as any time a person place, thing, circumstance, uh, or, or um, anything that's, pre when anything precious to us is taken away, when we're deprived of that, we're experiencing loss. And grief is this whole compendium of responses that we have to loss. It might be death. It might, I mean, I'm sorry, it might be anger. It might be uh, fear, it might be sadness, it might be overwhelm. There are so many ways we experience grief. And that's what's a little tricky about it. Sometimes we're grieving or we're dealing with someone who's grieving and we don't even know it for sure because they're not just crying and devastated and, you know, a ball of tears on the floor. Sometimes they're angry. Sometimes they're anxious. Sometimes they are um, just like frozen. So we never know exactly what face of grief we're going to see because grief has many faces. And so that's what's a little bit tricky about it. And how we will experience our grief depends on who we are, what our life circumstances have been, and what's going on with us in that moment. Some people get very busy, you know, and, and you would think they're not impacted at all. Other people just freeze. And then, of course, there are those who, who are very emotional and, and, and might be reduced to just sobbing and wailing and, and not being able to function at all. But all of these manifestations are grief. Okay, so we have loss, we have grief. And what you just shared is, we're experiencing it and the people around us are experiencing it and we're all dealing it with the way we're dealing with it. So could you help us? Because I know, you know, some of us, you know, are in denial and just kind of pretend it's not there. And others are, like you said, you know, extreme feelers and very expressive and everywhere in between. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how about if we talk about a little bit about how do we deal with it for ourselves and then how can we really be of support to others that are going through it? Because they're both really important, especially because we're all different. And I used to be in um, the field of career transition. And when someone lost their job, there's an emotional roller coaster like there is with any loss. Yes. And how the person who lost their job is dealing with it may be different than their spouse. And we need to honor the roller coaster that both are on. So how about if we start out with self and then go to how do we be respectful and supportive of those that are close with us? Yes. So the most important thing I think with any of us is that we express what's going on. You, whether it's your anger, whether it's tears, whether it's fear, we need to express it. We need to, to, we need to feel it first and then express it, and then move through it. The problem is so often we're so freaked out about our grief because it's so powerful. It's so huge. It like takes over everything. No matter what your plan is about how you're going to be, suddenly you are just whatever you are, whatever emotion is going on with you. And it's kind of frightening for a lot of people because it's so huge. But I think we need to feel it, express it, and move through it. The problem is a lot of times people don't do all of those steps. They, they're afraid to feel it because it's so huge. So maybe they get busy or maybe they start focusing on something else or, or they just think they're dealing with it because they're... Um, 
they're just, they're actually sort of acknowledging it, but they're not even aware. They've moved to numbness, which often happens, or they've moved to uh, a lack of real awareness of what's happening with them. Um, and I think the, the expression is important. So you've got to find a friend, find a therapist, uh, find someone who can listen. And this is huge. Too often our friends try to fix us. And this is also partly an answer to the second part of your question. When someone is hurting, you don't have to be this all wise being who can help fix them. Because the truth is only they can heal themselves as they walk through the journey. And it's not a one day event. This is a journey. But if, if you can listen from the heart, supportively, you create a safe place for them to do what they really need to do. And that is to express whatever is going on with them. Okay, so in our culture, we're not really trained and supported to express our honest feelings. And I know you have all these wonderful tools that are body mind tools, in addition to, you know, verbally sharing and, mm -hmm. you know, let's kind of look at what we can do for ourselves and then how we can be for others. In addition to just, and listening is a whole, a whole huge topic that we could spend Yes. <laughs> just because we haven't been trained to listen either right. and, and and you said you know it's so important our, our intention is always good to be supportive and sometimes you know trying to give ideas and things is not what's supportive but just being there like you said and just receiving people empathically of what's going on with them not mm -hmm. trying to give them ideas or change just be there for them so let's start with self and again, and then move into how we can be there for others. What can we do for ourselves if we're not someone who's used to feeling, if we're not someone who's used to expressing, what are some of the tools that we can access, that we can use to move through this in a healthier way? And I, 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 you know, many of you know, I work with Stephen Covey and Covey quotes fall out of my mouth and he goes, um, <laughs> old feelings never die. They get buried alive and come out in uglier ways. And so it's really, really important to let ourselves yes. feel. So how do you help people with that? Wow, that is a great question, Robin. And, and again, I want to stress every person's grief is unique, depending on who they are, what they know and what they've experienced. So if you're someone who isn't very good at just crying your tears, talking to your friend, um, trying to feel better uh, in that way, then I would suggest the, the going inside methods. You know, there's nothing wrong with going inside, with looking at your, what you're feeling. Journaling can be really helpful for people who are more of that go inside type. Um, journaling helps us examine our feelings and, and even be able to chart our progress a little bit as we are going through it. In, my, in the book I wrote called Grief, When Will This Pain Ever End? I give so many different kinds of tools and articles, <clears throat> excuse me, articles. The chapters are actually very short because when we're grieving, it's hard to focus. So the chapters are short, but then there are lots of articles and tools and processes people can choose from to see what works best for them. I do feel like since so much of grief is this, um, how do I want to put it, uh, compressed, heavy energy, you know, like that we're, we're not our usual ebullient selves, it's an, a more of an inward kind of thing. So I think it's important to get ourselves moving. So if you can just get yourself out for a quiet walk in the morning, and I like to call it a gratitude walk, because gratitude is a very high vibration. Gratitude can help us through so much. So even if you're just taking a walk, 
and being grateful that the flowers are blooming or the sky is blue or the, the air smells good. That can actually help raise your vibration. And recently I was listening to a TED Talk done by Wendy Suzuki, and she was talking about how exercise, moving our bodies, actually changes our brain. So that's very helpful in helping the way that we're processing emotion. So movement, journaling, um, certainly introspection. Um, let yourself have the time you need to maybe just bask in the memories uh, cry those tears, go through old pictures or things like that that you may have. It sounds like that could be painful, and, and many people couldn't do that right away when the, when the grief experience is fresh, but there is value in really going through the experience and the relationship, perhaps, that you had that is now lost. Um, I think there are also th tools in energy psychology like meridian tapping. Um, meditation, I think, is huge. I'm a daily meditator, and that's gotten me through a lot of crises in my life. Um, there are a lot of processes in that field of energy psychology that can be very helpful. Um, and what I do when I'm working with a grieving person is I kind of see in the initial consultation what sort of person they are, what sort of griever, if you will, whether they need to really work on the anger or work on the, um, the sadness, if I need to bring them out more or help them contain some of the hugeness of the emotions. So it really varies a lot from person to person. But on the whole, I think gratitude, service to others, movement. We've got to move our body. We've got to take care of our nutrition. We've got to get sleep. And sometimes that's really hard because sleep is one of the first things to go. And then when you're trying to help someone else, it's really, again, about testing the water of where they are. You know, if they're really introverted or they're just feeling really sad, Getting them out for a run is probably not going to be the best thing to do. Tune in to them. See what they need. Be present to them. And I always say approach the whole thing with the intention of being supportive and comforting, not fixing. Don't try to fix anybody. Don't try to teach, preach, heal. You know, don't try to do any of that because everybody's got to walk through their experience themselves. Well, that's a lot of great tools. And you know, the self-care piece, you know, is, you know, some people embraced the, the lockdown in a really healthy way instead mm -hmm. of, you know, they couldn't go to the gym. So they're doing push-ups, you know, <laughs> right. Create their own gym at home, you know, getting outside, putting, you know, feet on mother earth journaling. Um, so important. Uh, it's one of the best therapies I know of, you mm -hmm. know, just getting it out, getting it out and yes. uh, giving ourselves permission to feel because that's not something a lot of us have been you know, well educated about and um, and being respectful of uh, where other people are at, and sometimes you know, just asking, how can I be of support? You know, yes. I know we're both yes. going through a really hard time. The world has changed, and I love the way you said looking at pictures. You know, remembering some of the things like when you're gathering with friends and family that might you know, even bring up more of that loss that can ignite some of those feelings too. That you really miss it. You know, you miss mm -hmm. hugs, you know, I know yes. a lot of people that were hugging their teddy bears and their animals, you know, some people didn't have either one. So I said, get a teddy bear, you know, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people got dogs during oh, COVID. Oh <laughs> my gosh. It was hard to find a dog. It's true. That time. It's so really true. how about if we move it the next step, you know, once we've allowed ourselves to feel and telling the truth about, you know, what's going on with ourselves, because we're all in our own journey on that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, doing things to take care of ourselves. Um, you know, I've been talking to a lot of people lately and they're saying, you know, people are different. Some people are just fine and other people aren't. And um, several people are saying, you know, I, I, I don't have my mojo back. 
How do I, how do I get that back? Because I miss it and I want it and I know it will help me and, and I don't know how to do it. So what can we do for that? You know, there's actually a phenomenon that, that psychologists are talking about now they're calling languishing, which is this sort of state. It's not depression and it's, and it's not, I'm back to normal. It's this, you know, we've all been through so much push pull in the, in this last year and a half that there's just this kind of compressed feeling, subdued, um, affect that so many of us are experiencing and they're referring to that as languishing. And so it isn't, I can't function, but it's, but it isn't, I'm fabulous you know, and we want to feel more fabulous. And so I think, again, there are many things we need to do. One is, you know, first of all, we've got to look within and see what we need and love ourselves enough to give it to ourselves. So often, (laughs) (laughs) so often we should on ourselves instead of giving ourselves what we really need because we think we should be better than we are or should be healing quicker than we are. And so none of that, none of that allow yourself to just be where you are. And again, I, I want to reiterate, grief isn't an event. It's a journey this is not going to be over in three days. Remember the old three days you got off from work when you were grieving? I mean, it's, that's crazy. It's ridiculous. But we do move through different phases of the grief. And I really want to take this moment to say there are not five stages of grief. This is a huge misunderstanding that came from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's work, The Five Stages of Death and Dying, Anger, Denial, Bargaining, all of that is definitely happening to people who are dying. But grieving people grieve in dimensions. There are no stages, and so don't worry that you didn't get angry, so you're afraid now you can't heal. There's no requirement that you go through those five stages. So just allow yourself to be your real self in whatever is going on. And I have to tell you, I'm, I'm kind of one of those people, Robin. I want to be feeling great. I want to feel fabulous. And I want to be happy in my life. And when I'm not feeling that, I'm not the most patient with myself. And so I sometimes have to pull out my own book and remind myself, no, maybe today's a day that we just make a gratitude list because we can't even feel enough energy to want to go take that walk. Maybe today's a day that I just call an old friend and reminisce about something that has nothing to do with my loss. You know, we also want to remember that we have to keep giving ourselves experiences to remember that life is bigger than what we're experiencing right here, right now, because we can get stuck in that and then become very myopic about being able to see that there's hope, that there's more to go on for, you know, and that it can be better. So. That self-care piece, I just can't emphasize enough because probably because I'm so bad at it. I I don't think so. I don't think I think you're quite good, actually. (laughs) Well, you know, you you talked about the stages of grief and the dimensions of grief and loss. Mm -hmm. What's the distinction between those? You mentioned the five stages or four or three, whatever that we're familiar with. But what are the dimensions a little well, dim- bit more. Dimensions are like a whole plethora of things that are possible, but not naming a specific thing you have to go through. Like, for example, one of the first dimensions can be shock, numbness, denial. Sometimes people go through a dimension that's time distortion, like they can't remember what day it is. Where another dimension can be confusion and and um, 
misunderstanding. So in, in my grief book, I name all these different dimensions and I describe them in a little more detail. But the, the big thing is it's like um, a compendium of things that are possible. And you know what? And everybody's not going to go through every dimension. So that's the thing, and that's what I want to open up in people's awareness. Be generous, be authentic, and allow yourself and others to actually experience whatever's going on. There is no right and wrong about how to grieve and how to walk through grief experiences. There is no right or wrong. Whatever this, you're doing is okay. Uh, you know, that's so helpful because we're all unique and you know you have so many valuable resources i want to write in the chat how people can get your book the title of your book um could you oh i have visuals oh great <laughs> so this is the grief book it's called grief when will this pain ever end and it's available on amazon of course and the other one that's pertinent to what we're talking about is saying the right thing when you don't know what to say and this is so critical. And if I could say one thing about this, uh, this book, I love. It's a little book, but it's filled with the kinds of things you don't want to say and the kinds of things that are helpful. But just to, to generalize, you want to come from your heart. When somebody is hurting, they need your humanity, not your database. So when you come from the heart and you say something like, oh, I don't, I can't imagine how painful this is for you. Or even saying, I don't know what to say. This is so tough. You know, being honest like that is more helpful than, well, you know, I guess God needed him more than you did. Or, you know, hang on, there's going to be another person you're going to love someday. It's going to be fine. You know, that doesn't address the emotionality the person is feeling in the moment. So just be a human, companion them in their sadness or in their pain. Don't lecture, teach, or preach. Doesn't work. And particularly for those of us who are working in network marketing, you know, you may have the greatest product in the world, which we in LifeWave think we do. But you can't lead with the product. You have to lead with how are you? How has this time been treating you? And I think, Robin, you're the, the one who taught me, no one cares what you know until they know that you care. And that couldn't be more true in what we're saying here. These tips and tools I'm giving you today are not just helpful with somebody who's suffered a death or a health loss or something else. They're helpful with any human you're talking to because every human wants to feel seen, heard, and understood. And if you create that, you're a long way down the road. That's so beautiful. I, I can't believe we're at the bottom of the hour. And, oh, you know. I know. How did they happen? <laughs> I mean, Paula gave me like, how many? 27 questions. <laughs> We could go on. It's and a that. big topic. <laughs> it's a huge topic. So, you know, concluding, what do you want to leave people with, Paula, before we open up for Q&A and complete mm -hmm. the 30 minute part? I guess the most important thing I could stress is when someone is hurting, they need your humanity. They need your authenticity. They need your listening ears. They don't really need your, your mental acuity or your wisdom or your solutions. They need to find those things for themselves. And they can if you create the safety that comes when you are authentic and listening and caring, truly caring, coming from your heart. And people can feel that. And um, mm -hmm. can I give another Covey quote? Absolutely, darling. It just says what you just said, actually. And I, I share this all the time. Most of you have heard this already. The deepest need of the human soul is to be appreciated, acknowledged, affirmed, and understood. 
And, and that's what we get to do. That's what we get to do for people. Well, what a gift to this planet, especially right now, Paula, because I know a lot of people, you know, it's very uncertain times and we've all gone through major loss, major loss of our old, our, our way of being that mm-hmm. got ripped out from us. And, and we have to reinvent ourselves. And, and, and what you said, think about the self-care piece. What are those ways that we can take care of ourselves? Just getting outside, being in nature, you know, journaling the things, you know, eating well, drinking a lot of water, Mm -hmm. moving our bodies, the basic things that have us feel good about ourselves and allowing ourselves to feel, which is not something we're really good at, but we're getting better, right? We are getting better. Yes, we're getting better. Yes. I would like to offer your listeners, uh, any who might be interested, a a complimentary 20-minute consultation. If there are things I've said that are sparking something within you or you have questions about, I'm happy to offer that. And uh, of course, you know, as these things happen, my website, paulashaw.com, is down today, but it should be back up even by the end of the day. The other thing is, if any of you really are interested in mastering being able to have these helpful conversations, I am. I have an online course starting September 15th called Saying the Right Thing. And that course, uh, since we're doing the beta run, any of your people who are interested We'll get it at the $97 price. It's going to be $197 after this, but uh, because I would love these people in the beta group to be the kind of people that are your people, uh, I'm opening that up, and that landing page will be available this afternoon. It'll be called sayingtherightthing.com. If you go there, the registration and all of that is available. So if you're interested in the consult, you can go to paulashaw.com, which is going to be up and running this afternoon. I'm sorry it isn't. And um, also you can email me at pshaw, S-H-A-W, light, L-I-G-H-T, at Gmail. And maybe we can put that in the chat too. P Shaw Light I, Gmail if you have interest. I got it. And we'll make sure that we get it in the newsletter also. Oh, people. that'd be great. So- Yes. Yeah, so now let's open up for questions. If anyone I has questions for Paula, we'll take a few minutes. Uh, as if anyone, you can just put them in the chat. And uh, Paula was one of the great gifts I met through LifeWave, and uh, mm-hmm. we met at the conference last. Uh, what was that? Was that last January of twenty one? Twenty twenty. No. Yeah, that's right. It was at the beginning of twenty twenty. Yeah. And may I say, it was love at first sight, wasn't it? <laughs> Gregory and Gregory's given us full permission. <laughs> so it's okay. Yes, we you, haven't cut him out. <laughs> uh, you helped me through a challenging time because, you know, Gregory wasn't there. And, and um, so that was a tough time. And we, we laughed and we had a major bonding. So anyone yes, had did. questions, um, you can put them in the chat. I know there's several people that are on the call that have been through a personal loss recently um let's see what does oh oh karen is asking what does move through it look like Ooh, that's a great question yeah we've all known somebody who let's let's just use the example whose husband died 10 years ago and they're still in the persona of the grieving widow they haven't been able to step back into life And sometimes that's because, well, it can be for many reasons. It could be because they haven't known how to process the pain. They haven't had any help. They haven't had someone to talk to. They're they're stuck in their loneliness or that kind of thing. Um, Moving through it is is really about re-entering life. And, And, you know, one of the things I always like to point out to people is we can't get back to normal. How many times have we heard people saying during this pandemic, I want to get back to normal, but that normal is gone. That normal has changed, but the new normal could possibly be even better 
than the old normal or could hold new opportunities for growth, for, for joy, for expansion, for increasing our personal depth. So moving through it is taking us from this place of pain and agony to a place where we can be more back into life. And one of the paths that I think is the most useful is being of service. If you can find someone that you can be of service to or a group or, or a cause, that can really help us re-enter life and move through our pain as well. That's so beautiful. And I remember when I was going through some of my darkest time, that's exactly what got me out of it, is getting outside of myself into something bigger and doing some yes. service work. And I don't think you realize um, Karen is someone who just recently lost her husband. Oh, and Karen, I hope you'll take take me up on that uh, complimentary consultation. I'd love to talk to you in more depth about your specific situation. Beautiful, beautiful. And uh, Dr. Thomas is hand up. And then we have another question from uh, Sarah, I believe. So Tom, uh, Dr. Tom, can uh, you want to unmute your line? There you go. Oh, thank you so much. Um, really valuable information. Thank you, Paul. It's beautiful. Oh, and thank you. I especially love the, the description of being a listening space. And you helped mm -hmm. me turn a light bulb on for myself. Uh, I'm at a family reunion. And I uh, did not listen to somebody yesterday. How would you suggest when we see that in ourselves and we see what, you know, I jumped in with a fix and she seemed to be okay with it, but looking back now, she probably had more to say, right? What would you do to re like, how could I go back there? You know, family dynamics mm -hmm. are already sort of set in stone and she, uh, what would be a good way to reapproach her? First of all, I'm so delighted that you saw that. And may I say that for men, because your left brain is actually bigger than your right brain, you tend to naturally be more solution oriented. So men have a much harder time not finding a solution or fixing. So you were just following your nature. However, I love that you've had this insight. And you know, my first thought, Dr. Tom, is... I would, you remember I was talking about authenticity. So often, you know, grievers, by the way, have radar for authenticity, for inauthenticity, for when we're present, when we're not. I would, I would just maybe even if it's possible, if you're going to see her again, just say, you know, I was thinking about what I said to you yesterday. And I realized that I was telling you how to handle your situation, and I really wasn't listening to what's going on with you. Can I have another shot at that? Or can I, you know, can I ask a couple of questions so that I really am clear? Or, or is there anything you wanted to talk about that you didn't get to? You know, I would just own it and, and say I've had a new insight and just realized that maybe I wasn't serving you in the best possible way. Is that, is that doable? That's doable. It's a challenge and it's, yeah, it feels right. Thank you. Oh, good. Oh, I hope to meet you someday. I love your yeah. energy. Yeah. That's and I, you know, that, that, I think we've all done that. And to go back in a vulnerable, transparent place and said, I am so sorry. I realized I, I don't feel like I was listening very well. And that's, it just kind of, takes down the barriers and gets yes. a deeper connection when we're like that. Um, Sarah has a question, and this is a really big one, I think, for so many people right now. How do we deal with the loss of family or loved ones because we have different views about what's going on in the world, whether it's vaccinations or politics or whatever? Mm. And um, what can we say? And I, it's hit me deeply. I mean, I've cried myself to sleep on that one. So mm. what can we do about that? That's really a huge issue going on right now. Um, it is. I get really, it. Yep. Get yep. it big time. Uh, in, in fact, I, I'm dealing with that myself within my own family. And I think what is really important, Sarah, is to remember that nothing matters more than love. The love that you have for your family members has to supersede 
what their choices are, what their politics are, you know, all of that. And if we can just keep our thoughts focused on what we love, why we love, how we love, and, and let love take first place always, love be what's prominent, then I think we're guided away from conversations. And sometimes, like in our family, we'll just say, okay, we're not going to talk politics, you know, or we're not going to talk about this or about that, because we know the, that differing opinions and, and heated discussions are not going to promote the love that we actually have for each other in that moment. So I would just say prioritize love and do whatever you need to to keep that in first place. Beautiful. Thank you. That's, you know, that's actually what I finally got to. And that's what we talk about, you know, yeah. setting what we don't talk about and what we do talk about. We talk about how much we love each other. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Um, there's, uh, let's see. It seems my ability to dream died with the loss of my husband. This mm-hmm. is from Patty. Do you have any advice? Oh, Patty, I feel that in my heart. Wow, what a huge loss. Um, You know, sometimes we experience things temporarily that won't be forever. Uh, It could be that because you had been so long in a pattern of sleeping with him that your, your body, mind, and spirit can't feel totally... Um, relaxed enough to go to that dream state without him being present. And as you, as you move through time and do the work, that will change. But I think, remember, deep sleep that creates dreams is an act of surrender. And when life has thrown us uh, uh, this upheaval, this something out of the blue that that turned our world upside down, it's hard to trust enough to surrender into deep sleep. But that can change in time. So what I would say is just accept it as a thing of the moment, a thing that's happening right now. And when your psyche is ready, when the subconscious, when the brain, when all those parts that are part of this, when they're ready to trust and surrender into deep sleep, I think your dreams will come back. And and she also wants to know about dreaming for her business and dreaming for her life, in addition to sleep dreaming. Ah, oh, so she's not able to vision something positive and something expansive. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, when life has dealt us what feels like a really hard, cruel blow, uh, it's hard to trust life, right? It's hard to trust the universe that there are good things out there. And so sometimes we kind of don't want to step into the water. We don't want to dip our toe in and say, well, now I can imagine my business scaling and going here and this happening and that happening. Also, I think energetically, you're not at the vibrational level to actually see and believe that. But that doesn't mean that that can't change as well. So remember, everything's energy. And when we've experienced a serious loss, we're at this kind of low, uh, slow vibrational level. And that's why a lot of things we used to be able to do or feel just like we were talking about feeling fabulous and or, or languishing. You know, sometimes we just have to keep putting one foot in front of the other each day, try to do a little something that's going to increase your energy, increase your, your good feeling. Maybe it, and it might be something like planting a garden. It may have nothing to do with your business. Remember, it all falls together when you're feeling the joy, when you're feeling those good vibration feelings. Maybe it's dancing that you need to do that's going to actually enable you to visualize your business growing, as crazy as that sounds. Petting your dog, whatever gives you joy, puts you in alignment with bigger and better and higher vibration. Mm. 
was I, that was a gift for all of us. <laughs> Those little things of watching something grow yeah. can make yes. You know, living in the question, what brings us joy? Well, we've come to the end of our time, and I know we could go on and on and on. This is a really, really important gift for people, and I know this um, video is going to be shared a lot because you know we're all going through it, and you have such a depth and breadth of wisdom and wealth of resources for people to access. So we'll make sure we put that in the newsletter that people can you know um, know about your books and have the recording and the offer that you made for everyone. So thank you, my dear. That was oh. really a gift to all of us. Really beautiful. So we're going to stop so our much. recording. Yes. Thank you, yes. Robin. And uh, let's see. 